Yes, here we are in episode 107, and today we're going to talk about not settling, but desiring greatness. My name is Greg Wasinski, and you're listening to the Faith in Real Life podcast, which you probably clicked on a link to get here, but just in case you accidentally clicked on the wrong one, that's where you're at. And uh, I am joined by Mrs. Millie Preble. Millie, good to see you. Great to see you again, always. Millie, I... uh, I love today's topic. I, I did a morning show a couple weeks back on greatness. It's part of my Monday motivation series. And uh, I am not one who can handle when people don't desire greatness. It, it, it is one of my pet peeves. And, and it's not a judgment. It's just that I don't, I don't understand why everybody doesn't want to be great. And I know that they can't. Uh, and it's not even about the work that they do. I'm just, where's the desire? Mm-hmm. You know, and, and I think that we live in a world right now I firmly believe that some of our young people and some of the generations that we're encountering right now don't desire to be great at anything, that they just want to fit in. Do you see that at all? Do you see that with people? I do. And I think, you know, it is, it, the times are very different. And it's really, it's very, very hard to give someone else motivation or inspiration. That is such an inside job. Right. You know, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. But I always say you can put a little salt in his diet. <laughs> Make them retain all that That's water. That's right. Is that my problem? Am I retaining all the water? No, Is you're that... just not thirsty enough. <laughs> oh. All right. Well, I'll drink more water. But yeah, today uh, we're going to talk about not settling. And I want you to think about your life and your dreams and the things that you're working on. And, and what are the aspects of your life that you've allowed yourself to settle for something that is less than what you deserve? And how are you fighting to make your life great? How are you fighting to enhance your own situation and not waiting for everybody else to do it for you or accepting mediocrity as a grade of saying, eh, things are okay. You know, I guess it's all right. I don't want that. I want you to have something where you wake up and you go, I'm ready today. I'm ready to do something that really fuels my soul yeah that's one of the common sayings people you know i think that we should get rid of is it is what it is it's like yeah. no, it, it is what you allow right and uh and i think that for that being a mantra is a is an indication of kind of where we're at mentally with uh settling i, I do have to say that i'm guilty of saying that but <laughs> i think that people that know me usually say that when i say it is what it is that means don't ask me any more about it <laughs> i'm done talking about <laughs> yeah this. that means like i've thought about every aspect of it i don't care what you think i'm moving on but no, I, you know, for me, when I was, I was the baby of the family, uh, I was the, the youngest boy. I have a younger sister, but she's 12 years younger than I am. So I was the baby for a long time. And, you know, the baby of the family kind of gets special treatment. So I was lazy. I mean, I was, I look at my son and I'm like, this is payback. When my son sometimes doesn't want to do things, I'm like, uh, it's like payback. But I was a lazy kid. And I let my older brothers do stuff and I would try to hide from the work. And now here I am at 45 years old and probably for the last 20 years of my life, I've been a workaholic. I mean, I I feel guilty when I'm not working. And I was just doing some work the other day. I went from uh, doing my morning show to working in the afternoon on administrative stuff, to recording in the afternoon. And then I'm painting my deck at like 930 at night. And I'm thinking to myself, why don't I desire to be lazy anymore? Because it's like <laughs> all I've done is go from one thing to the next. But um, no, I, I feel this need to want to make everything that I do quality. Right. Some might call it a perfectionist, but I don't know. I, I just, I, I want it to be quality. Right. And, and even my work in ministry, you know, after, I don't know, how long did I spend 15 years in, in the business world before ministry? Uh, yeah, that would be about right that I carry over the desire for excellence that I had in the business world and I've put it into my ministry. And some people think that maybe the ministry makes more money than it does because it offers quality or some people think that this is more of a hobby because it offers quality. But the fact of the matter is, is that I work 10 or 12 hours a day to make sure that the little touches are there. Right. Because I don't just want something that's okay. I want something that touches souls and touches people and they right. go, And I think that's, wow. I think that's something, I mean, it's scripture. We're called, you know, as a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Mm. And I think if we all really dig deep and look at our calling and our gifts, 
you know, are we presenting our best gifts or are we just throwing out something that's not polished up, that's not framed well? Um, and can we be proud of it and can our God be proud of it? So I think right. there's really something about, yes, we have gifts, but it's also our responsibility to nourish and grow and develop those gifts to the best gift we can offer back to God and others. And I would challenge somebody that might be listening right now that is saying, you know what, I just don't have the time. I'm happy with where things are and I want to coast a little bit. I get it. I mean, there are times when I like to coast too. I mean, you know, and, and I do my best to do that. But here's also what I'll tell you. And it goes back to the scripture that you just read from Ephesians chapter four. Uh, and I think it's verse one. Mm-hmm. Um, if you don't use the gifts that God has given you to the most of their ability, that's a sin. Mm, yes. It's not a sin like you're going to burn in hell kind of sin, right? but it's a sin. Right. Well, there's this saying, too, that, you know, no one lights a lamp and puts it under a bushel. Right. You know, we are given the light that we're given to illuminate others, not to hide them in their darkness. Right. And somebody, what I've learned is that someone is always watching. Mm-hmm. Somebody is always watching for us to be the living example. And it might be a child. It might be a friend. Uh, it might be somebody that later on down the road, we're going to get into business with. Right. And they're going to, you know, we, we always talk about how in sales that the number one thing that we always looked at was when a salesman came in, what did his shoes look like? Mm-hmm. Didn't matter the suit he had on, didn't matter the tie, right. but if his shoes were dirty or unpolished mm-hmm. or they were really cheap, mm-hmm. I mean, I hate to say you're wearing mm-hmm. a $500 suit and you got mm-hmm. $30 you know, whatever, <laughs> but, but that was a sign that right. you didn't pay attention to that final detail. Right. And so it's always the little details that make us great. And well, it, there's that saying that, you know, how you do one, you do all. Right. And so we don't, we don't do it because it's ego driven. And especially if we're putting faith and real life together, we're doing it because we want to give our best to God. Mm-hmm. And it's okay if we think about it from a perspective of what our human needs Mm -hmm. are at first. But at the end of the day, when we examine our conscience, we want to be able to sit back and say, Lord, uh, I always say that uh, for myself, I always say, I played the game today. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to say that when I took the field today, I gave everything that I had Mm -hmm. and I left it on the field because you gave me these gifts to use. Yeah, there's a story of a... Um, I don't know if it's true or not, but it's the legend of this, this uh, guy that has a construction company and he's getting ready to retire. So it's this one foreman that works for him and he has gives him one last assignment to build this house and you get to keep the proceeds, anything, you know, over cost. So, you know, he decides, oh, this is my chance. I'm going to make a ton of money. So yeah. he does it real cheap and builds it and, you know, gets it finished and has a huge overage. And um, so the, uh, the, you know, the land, the guy that's going to retire, his boss is, I just want to let you know that I, I'm giving you this house. It's yours. Yeah. And he cut the corners yep. and he built it cheaply to make yep. more money. And now he inherited a piece of garbage. <laughs> right. And uh, that, is, that is a lesson right there that uh, you don't know what you're going to inherit. You don't know what you're going to be given. And so you put your best foot forward and you make it as great as possible. Right. Um, and I think that some of that we get as we grow older. So I'll ask you this question. If you could give your younger self one piece of advice, what would it be? Oh, gosh. Um, first of all, don't believe everything you tell yourself, <laughs> you know, the negative especially, um, yeah. and believe more in what your God says about you. Mm. I yeah. mean, because we are truly defined by our maker, and I think we allow the other non-maker um, to, you know, take away our dreams and, you know, and, and, and the value of who we really are. Well, and so much of what we do to succeed, and I will be, uh, I will admit this, uh, some of it is driven by fear. Mm-hmm. I, I, when I worked with my executive coach, uh, I found out that one of the motivators for me is uh, I'm afraid to let other people down. Mm-hmm. And so when I work harder, it's because I don't want anybody to think any less of me. Mm-hmm. Um, not that it's outside people that I'm worried about who they think I am but I don't want to let anybody down that is around me has donated to the ministry or thinks I could have done a better job. So sometimes fear does motivate us. Right. Yeah, I think that's true. I think we have to, you know, we can't allow uh, the fear of, you know, standing still 
be, um, you know, outweigh the fear of moving forward. We really right. have to have to you have to move, and you know, you can get trapped in that fear of, you know, and sometimes like you get you get to certain levels in your life, and you, you have a lot to risk. You know, when you were sure younger, you when you're more fearless, you know, there's not that much at stake, and I think the challenge you know, for movement becomes, as we get more settled, we have more to lose, but in our, sometimes in our settling, we get stuck. Right. And we forget that risk aversion that got us so far by moving, you know, with the Holy Spirit and moving without that fear. And we only have one life to live. So mm-hmm. why not put everything that we can into living a life of joy, to living it with these authentic relationships that help us become greater than we thought we could ever possibly be. Mm -hmm. Uh, A life in Christ has allowed me to experience more joy and euphoria than I ever thought was possible, but it's also sent human beings into my life who are authentic friends, Mm -hmm. who help me become great in what I do, um, not measuring secular success, Mm -hmm. but seeing the opportunity that God has given me to change hearts and change lives and letting that be the defining moment of personal value for me that it's not always about the bank account. Right. That was where, you know, I, we have a similar, you know, history in that I was in the business world and I was doing a lot of speaking and writing and, uh, and that led to business consulting. And as I started consulting, I could sort of get a bird's eye view, you know, and I could kind of see what I would discover is, you know, people were, if they weren't successful in business, usually they weren't successful in aspects of their life and they weren't successful in aspects of their life because they really didn't have a foundation of faith. Mm -hmm. Um, So I couldn't just go in there and say, you know, y'all just need Jesus. Um, But they really need... Well, you could. Yeah, I could. And then, you know, here's your check. See ya. (laughs) But... um, but it was very frustrating. So I, you know, I decided in turn to take that desire and that knowledge um, that I discovered to use, you know, my gifts in a different area. So maybe to go more right at the root mm. and see if I couldn't be a more help. What my ministry wouldn't be more helpful in helping people discover, you know, their spiritual foundation. Yeah. Because when you have a strong spiritual foundation, not that all your problems are going to go away. But you have the creator with you. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, you have the one that knows the um, the answers and you and you do you develop a team of good people around you Mm -hmm. that have skill sets and knowledge and prayer that can really help you in the journey. Well, and for me, I I think that, um, you know, I look at Zacchaeus up in the tree. And Jesus doesn't want him to stay there. Zacchaeus is happy to settle in the tree and watch from above. And Jesus calls him into relationship. I think about Peter, uh, this buffoon who keeps getting things wrong Mm -hmm. and keeps messing up, ultimately denying Christ, but he still wants to give him the keys to the kingdom. There are stories time and time again like this where Christ elevates those that he walked with on this earth to become more than they ever thought they could be. And he continues to do it now for us if we allow him into these things. So there's two things that I would say is that number one is that when we get into a situation or we look at our life, and and I want you to do this right now as you're listening, is I want you to think about where your life is right now today. And I want you to simply offer in prayer, whether it's during this podcast or whether it's tonight before you go to bed or this morning's prayer, I want you to say, God, what do you want from me? What do you really want from my life? I know the things that I kind of want, and maybe you want the same for me too, but you just want to make sure that it's centered on me. So God, what do you want from me? And I I relate this back to the quote by Oscar Romero that says, aspire not to have more, but to be more. Mm -hmm. Aspire not to have more, but to be more. So when we say, God, what do you want from me? It just changes our motive. It doesn't allow it to be ego driven. It doesn't allow it to be based on our personal wants, but it's a passion within us that we allow God to be the driver of. All right. And I think when we, when we do humble ourselves and surrender in all honesty and sincerity to what is, you know, I mean, and that's the $64,000 question. What is my purpose? What is my mission here mm-hmm. on earth? Well, first, no love serve. So if you have any work in any of those areas, yeah. you know, whether you don't know him, don't love him, or don't know how to serve him, um, that's a great place to start too. So we just want to make sure that once we do give that surrender, and once we invite God into the project, you know, he's the, he's the best taskmaster. Yeah. And, and change is inevitable. I mean, change is going to happen throughout our lives and, and we have to figure out how to adapt to it. Sometimes we are dealt a, a poker hand that quite frankly sucks. 
uh, we are dealt one that we don't think we deserve. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we are dealt one that is so extraordinary that we think, how great of a player am I mm. when the Lord is the one who gave us the cards? Well, that's if you, if you remember, it's he who gave the cards. Right. And so we have to remember that. So uh, Millie's Minute today it focuses on how change does and doesn't happen. And so we're going to take, uh, take a minute here to listen to Millie's thoughts on change. And I will give you that countdown. Uh, let's go forward this way. Let's go one, one, two, three, go. Well, I got this uh, this minute from Jim Collins' book, Good to Great, and he talks about change, and he uses some analogies about what change is and isn't. And he says, picture an egg. You know, it sits there, does nothing, until all of a sudden a chick pops through, and we think, oh, it's an overnight success. And But we didn't see it from the chick's point of view of all this change and growth going on with the interior of the egg. So he says change is more like a flywheel, something that's standing still, very heavy, and inch by inch we push and grow and get our resolve around it so we can start to turn it. And once we start to turn it, there's more resolve and more growth and more strength that pretty soon it's flying and then it starts to get momentum. So change isn't really always what it appears. There's no overnight success, but persevere, persistent growth and knowledge and wisdom, you can really move it forward and have the change that you desire. Oh, look at that. You had eight seconds left. You, oh. you, you flew right. You flew right into it. I was right like the flywheel. It. I was like, zzzz. Well, and you the know, RPMs there's so much there. in this to unpack that I didn't. Well, so let, let's I didn't go past it. Then. I love Jim Collins' concise, book, Good yeah. to Great. Uh, Jim Collins' book, Good to Great, if you haven't read it, it, it was uh, a business staple for a long time. And I still think it, it, I mean, it definitely has applicability. I don't know if executives use it as much, but it talks about how good is the antithesis of, the great. of great. It's, it, it is like we think that, hey, because we're good enough, because we have an audience, we're just going to go on autopilot and we're going to do our shtick. And it's not. It's not that way. We're In a business, you're not going to say, hey, I have customers. Gonna wing they it. buy from me. Nobody else is going to ever invent something greater. Nobody else is going to ever provide better customer service. Mm -hmm. No. You have to be evolving to know that change is going to happen and uh, to allow God to be at the center of it so that you can see where you need to go to next. Stop settling for where you are and desire to be great. Right. And I think, you know, there, it doesn't have to be a daunting task either. There are some steps I was sharing with you earlier. I wrote a story about, you know, reinvention and there are definite steps and some soul searching and things that we can do mm -hmm. to try and help us go from where I am good to where I can be great. And some of the things, you know, you just have to have a real honest self-assessment with, you know, be brutally honest, you know, it, mm -hmm. it doesn't do you any good to self-reflect behind a mask. So, you know, what are my strengths? What are my witness? You know, what are my weaknesses? And especially identifying our passion. I mean, I know a lot of people throw that term around so much, find your passion. Um, but really, it's just as simple as going back to what you loved as a kid. You know, what could your parents not get you to stop doing, right. you know? Where was that passion? Where did it start? And um, I know for me, a fourth grade teacher told me to never stop writing, um, and so, you know, she also deemed me Motor Mouth Millie, which is a whole other podcast. But, you know, just because we have a voice doesn't mean that we don't have to grow it and have wisdom behind it to put more value well, in it. Because we have to understand where it comes from. Uh, we like to watch the show uh, Biggest Loser mm -hmm. at home. And what I think has made the show sustainable is not necessarily that just people who are uh, unhealthy – find a way to change their lives but it's listening to the stories of why these people became obese mm -hmm. in the first place mm -hmm. and usually it is not just because they love food right and when you talk about being honest with yourself we have to identify what is holding us back right. from the authentic life of brilliance and joy and greatness yeah. that we are all called i would say that God is great, right? I mean, God is great in everything that he has made and built and given us to enjoy. And we are his children. We become part of him when we receive the Eucharist in Jesus. Why would we think that we're not capable of greatness mm -hmm. if we are made in the image of the creator to someday return to him? Right. And I think, too, we have to remember, you know, we are made in his image 
And so we can't necessarily, um, like I said, hide our gifts under a bushel basket. Um, but we do need to have those. We need to polish and shine our strengths so that when we do offer them to the world, they have value. And I think, too, sometimes, you know, we get really caught up in the, the lies that we've told ourselves, and you know, oh, ma- yeah. like you say, with the biggest loser, it's never about the food. You know, sometimes it's about the beliefs they had as a young child, or a hurt, or a pain. Um, and if we re-examine and can reevaluate, sometimes our beliefs, um, and look at them with adult, loving eyes through God's eyes, you know, there are there are a lot of beliefs that we can just let go of. And just as an aside, Millie, there is a website if people are looking to eat healthier. If you go to milliecooksvegan.com, <laughs> uh, I can tell you that that woman is uh, incredible with the recipes that uh, she invents. In case you don't know, Millie uh, is a uh, vegan chef uh, and, and an incredible one at that. And uh, she actually does have a website, Millie Cooks Vegan, and uh, lots of recipes there. So as an aside, if you're looking for some greatness in food, go to milliecooksvegan.com. Even though you're not a sponsor, you even got right, your own so little you got commercial. I my own little there. plug. Um, but no, I do want to go back to that, that we can't allow ourselves to be held back. There's enough in life mm. going on that is trying to hold us back. Right. There's enough opposing forces that does a great job of knocking us down. Right. And Why it goes in back the world? to that foundation I was talking about. You know, if we don't have that foundation of faith, yeah. you know, when I met with my spiritual director, one of the last retreats I was on, he, was, he said, Why would, Why would you care about anyone else's opinion of you but God's? I'm like, yeah, that, that sounds good, but easier said than done. You know, it, we really have to let go of that secular, temporal, you know, what are the real true signs of success and look to a, a more eternal, heavenly perspective. It was like today's reading, you know, go to, you know, if you do, you know, fast and, you know, have obvious signs, that's your reward. But if you do it in secret and in silence, your reward will be in heaven. Right. And, and I used to tell young people all the time, um, you have to view it that what God knows about me is more important than what others think about me. Right. That's and a that, great that's one especially too. important for young people being bullied in, in younger generations of, uh, you know, millennials and other generations that, you know, we're just trying to fit in. You're trying to not stand out, but yet you desire to be recognized for your work. So you don't desire to be great, but yet you want that. I mean, inherently it's part of us. Mm-hmm to use our gifts from God. So you can't get in your own way either because there are many people that sabotage their own greatness when things start to go great. Right. Former addicts, especially. It's that fear. I think sometimes, you know, we look to, uh, I mean, you ask anybody that's successful, had any kind of success, and they'll tell you it's because I failed a lot. Yeah. I mean, if we, you know, we look Man, at I'm a very set, successful. we look at a, you know, a set back as a set up, for what's next and um gosh you know how could we navigate if we didn't know the wrong way to go right well people might be thinking they're they're in their car or they're listening right now and saying all right i'm buying into this um you've motivated me so what in the world am i supposed to do about it when i look in the mirror and i hate who i see or uh, i'm in a job that i've worked at for a long time and i don't feel like i'm gonna get anywhere mm-hmm. uh, what am i supposed to to do And so I'll give the first one. I'll let you give another piece of advice. The first one I'm going to say is dream of what you can be. Mm -hmm. You know, when we're kids, we dream all the time. We play make-believe. We think about what we're going to be on career day. Kindergarten, I can tell you that six-year-old Greg Wazinski, he was going to grow up and have the awesome job of being a gas station manager. That was my (laughs) career. Why? Because I love that that was when you didn't get to pump your own gas, mm. but the manager got to. Mm-hmm. So that's what I wanted to be. I wanted to be the guy who pumped gas. Uh, I but fulfilled the best that. gas pumper. Yeah, but I'm good. I get to do that now. I have achieved that dream. I get to pump my own gas. But no, but as adults, we stop dreaming what can be. And we think that what life has given us and where we're at right now has to be uh, exactly where we stay. And so number one, I want you to dream about what can be and find what your inner passions are that you can identify something within that sparks a fire. So that's number one. I think for me, one of the most important things is to be a lifelong learner. You know, I think this is such a great journey. And as we get older, we accumulate so many life skills, but it all goes back again to that passion. I remember, like I said, my fourth grade teacher, you know, Never Stop Writing and Motormouth Morgan. I mean, I get paid to speak and write now. So, you know, was I was it automatic? No, I had to learn and study 
And interestingly, in you know, my former beauty life of being you know, a speaker on the beauty circuit, I was trained, I had the good fortune to be trained by some amazing public speak coaches and sales coaches. And mm. it was just, I look back now, of course, through God's lens and see, you know, you were pretty crafty giving me all that training because you knew I was going to be speaking for you That's one exactly day. So, right. you know, it's just, it's amazing what he puts in your life when you're willing to do the work, you know, shoulder to the flywheel and, and keep maintaining that growth forward. Yeah. And, and when you learn, when you're learning things about yourself and when you're learning things about your craft or you're learning that uh, maybe I do love the company I work with, but I'm in the wrong job. So I just need to change where my talents are. And if your boss hasn't identified that you, you can, but, um, I would say that if you've learned that you don't have certain gifts, then as you mentioned a little bit earlier, surround yourself with people who compliment you. You don't have to, not everybody has to have the same likes and dislikes, but find people that can be the compliment that you need in order to fulfill yourself. So if you're putting together a small business and you're dreaming of starting something and you're really good in accounting, then don't try to do all the marketing. Don't try to do the sales. Find somebody who you can tell your dream to that wants to work with you so that you can stick to the numbers and the finances right. instead of trying to do it all. Right. And that's when you become mediocre because it's like, well, I'm doing it all so that I can have the, the mm -hmm. glory and the mm -hmm. acclaim and, and it's done my way. Right. And it's just, uh, I love watching Marcus Limonis on The Prophet because that show on MSNBC, he takes people and says, this is why you're in a hole. It's because you wanted to do everything the way right. that you thought it should be done. Right. I want to infuse these ideas. Right. And people are so, they fight that and fight that and fight that. Right. And we can't do that in our own lives. We have to recognize where we fall short and then allow people into our lives who help raise us up. Right. Well, it just reminds me of a great book I read when I was opening my business called The Entrepreneurial Myth. And the entrepreneurial myth is sort of like, you know, you're, you, you know, you're a great baker, so you open a bakery. Mm. Well, you know, one skill set has absolutely entirely nothing to do with another. So, you know, you think to, well, I'm going to answer the phones. I'm going to create the marketing. I'm going to do all this other stuff. And it takes you away from your best skill set, which was baking in the meantime. So then again, you start you know, cooking the books. Right. You do. <laughs> well, they, there's that. But you, um, you really need to get, um, like you said, other like-minded people in, you know, that can buy into your vision but that also have the skills that you don't, you know, and it just reminds me of scripture that, you know, we all have, you know, same spirit, different gifts, you know, we, and that's what defines us and creates us as the body of the church, because, you know, some have the gift of prophecy, some have speaking, some have numbers, some have hospitality, right. but together when we combine those gifts, we are the full united body of of Christ. And I love that about our ministry because the one thing that God has always given me is the vision to be in communion with others, to try to collaborate. Doesn't mean that everybody always wants to collaborate back, but I believe that we can do something very special together. And not everybody should love what I have to say because people are on different planes and I've been called to deliver a message of faith in real life that is trying to journey with uh, a certain audience in depthly. Mm -hmm. But I want to reach those who were like me 15 years ago, a guy who thought he was great, but in essence was mediocre because he placed all of his trust in the world. Mm. And now I'm able to see greatness in a new way. Uh, so the last one that I would give you uh, is, let's see, how do I want to say this? The haters are going to hate. Mm. Don't let jealousy and uh, confusion of what other people see destroy your dreams. Don't let anybody ever rob you of living your dream because they don't understand it or because they can't see it the way that you see it. Mm. That jealousy will exist. People will try to take it from you because they don't have uh, the ability to do it themselves or they don't have the guts to go after their own dreams. And so they will try to pull you back into the same place that mm -hmm. they are. Mm -hmm. So part of being great is accepting criticism, mm -hmm. knowing when criticism comes from a place of love and somebody really cares about you because they've prayed about it. And then there's just people who want you to feel the same hurt that they do. Mm -hmm. And we, we can't have to let remember that everyone's us. not going the same place we're going. That is true. I'm taking sunscreen just in case. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> but yes, uh, that greatness is what will lead us to heaven. It is what will enjoy us or allow us to enjoy this world. And, you know, for all of you out there, I just want you to know that in mediocrity, nothing uh, spectacular ever happens. Uh, it's kind of like owning a box of crayons and you have the six pack. Mm-hmm. And then one day somebody hands you the 128 pack mm-hmm. and you're like, what a canvas I can create. Mm-hmm. So my friends live for the 128 pack. Use all the colors God gave you. Be great today, not because the world needs another success story, but because God cre- created you for greatness and he doesn't want you to be mediocre. Mm-hmm. Uh, Millie, final thought? I just want to let people know it's, it's never too late mm-hmm. to be a better self and to offer your best self to the world. God bless you and keep you. That's our Faith in Real Life podcast for this week. We thank our sponsor, the Jess and Lilia Gifts from Above Foundation. They are doing amazing work to bring hope to the world. And we are so blessed that they have sponsored this podcast today to bring it to you. And I can tell you that in our next quarter of programming episodes, we are in need of additional sponsors for the Faith in Real Life podcast. So we'd ask you to go to faithinreallife.com, view other episodes for videos, resources, and other sources of inspiration that you can share with others all for free. And if you feel so inclined and are able, we'd love for you to make a donation to support the work that we are doing for the ministry. Uh, So on behalf of Millie Preble and myself, I thank you for listening to the podcast. God bless you. God keep you. Go out and be great.